our last speaker this today is Yves Coudère, and he will talk about wave particle duality. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I was, uh, I'm uh, most grateful, especially because I'm not going to talk about a quantum system. And I'm also a, a pure experimentalist. So I'm not going to talk about theory either. So uh, this work was done uh, over the years uh, with Emmanuel Lefort, who is uh, at Institut Langevin, uh, ESPCI, and with a number of collaborators on most of the things that we'll uh, discuss today. Yeah, we are done with Mathieu Labousse, Marc Miskin, and Stéphane Perard. Uh, ma, uh, both Marc, uh, Mathieu Labousse and, uh, and Stéphane Perard did their thesis, PhD thesis on this uh, subject. Um, so, the, the, I, I guess for some of you uh, know very well the system, and some of you have never heard of it, so I will have a brief. brief uh, summary of what is this uh, classical system in which you couple a, a, a bouncing droplet with a surface wave. I will uh, then, uh, sorry, I will then discuss the uh, uh, so-called wave mediated path memory and then I will turn to several experiments. So we did quite, in the, over the years, we did quite a number of experiments on uh, seeking a, a form of duality in this system. Uh, so we did a uh, a form of diffraction, a form of tunneling, uh, confinement in a cavity. We uh, found a sort of Landau levels, a sort of Zeeman-like uh, effect and so on. But I will concentrate on two experiments. One is uh, uh, what happens to these objects when they are confined in a 2D uh, harmonic potential well. And the uh, second thing, can you get self-spinning states in the system? If I have time, I will discuss a little bit the uh, possibility of temporal uh, reversibility in this uh, dissipative system. Okay, so initially this work was uh, triggered by a teaching at University Paris Diderot, and we found this system by, by chance. We, I will uh, just show you briefly what it looks like. Um, it is a system in which you have a particle, which is a droplet, which is coupled to a surface, a surface wave, and I will describe some of the experiments that I really did. Uh, most of our work can be found on this uh, website with uh, PDFs of uh, the articles. So uh, for the beginning, I will just uh, say a word about why, how we found it. So as you know, if you deposit a, a drop of liquid on the same liquid, it merges in a matter of about a tenth of a second. And in fact, if you uh, have a system in which you vibrate a substrate, then the drop can bounce and survive for an infinite time. Uh, the idea being that uh, the drop is separated from the bus by an air film, and this air film has no time to break before it bounces up again. So I will show you a few films, because I mean, it's late in the afternoon, so you you probably need some entertainment. Um, so this is what it looks like in, uh, in slow motion. So that's the basic bouncing of a drop on a, on a fluid bath. And uh, typically, the drop is uh, one millimeter in size. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, and um, vibration frequency is uh, 50 hertz or 80 hertz, depends. Okay, so this is not so interesting, but while we were doing this experiment, we found that there was another regime, which I can show you. This is not the slow motion, this is a real time. And you can see the bath, and you see that the drop moves spontaneously at constant velocity as it is coupled with a uh, quite intense surface wave. So this is for, yes? So the drop is from the same material? Yes. Both are silicon oil. Actually, you draw the, the drop out of the bath with a toothpick. That's the way you create it. So why does it... Uh, d uh, so, of course, we were surprised to see it walk. And we... So this is the bouncing in this regime. So this is for much larger amplitude of oscillation of the bath. As you see, the drop uh, moves. So this is a slow motion, so it doesn't move so much, but uh, it moves a little bit forward. 
because it bounces asymmetrically on the bump that it had formed at the previous uh, oscillation. So this repeats itself, and this makes the, the system uh, self-propelled. You can see it again here, as seen from above. And again, you see this asymmetry of bouncing. It's asymmetry breaking. So the, the drop always bounces on the forward front of the, of the, of the, bath, of the bump. And in fact, it, it is propelled by the fact that it, it falls on a slanted uh, interface. Uh, so I'll just show you for fun a uh, collision of two, two drops. So you can put two drops on the same path. And there are two situations. So you organize collisions. And this is one case. Maybe it was a bit too fast, so I'll show you again. And as you see, they have repelled each other without touching each other. This is the first uh, regime. Now you can change a little bit the, the impact parameter. And in that case, you, you see that the uh, uh, interaction between the drop can be either repulsive or attractive. This is the attractive situation. This was studied by uh, Suzy Protier during a PhD. OK. So uh, I will uh, keep uh, going fast on this part. And I will uh, just discuss briefly the different types of bouncing. So why do you have a transition? from a simple bouncing to what we call walking, which is a, so this is a, so the, the phenomenon depends of many parameters. It depends on the, on the oil, it depends on the frequency, it depends on the, on the, on the diameter of the drop, it depends on the uh, amplitude of forcing. So you, we fix the oil, we choose one oil, one frequency, and then we, uh, this is a phase diagram showing the different behaviors of the drop as a function of the diameter of the drop and the amplitude of forcing here, horizontally. So in all the white region, the drop bounces. It bounces in the region B at the forcing frequency. Uh, in, the, in this region, it becomes, the bouncing becomes chaotic. And then finally, in the yellow region, this is where the drop moves at constant velocity. Now in the two gray region, at the low acceleration, the drop disappears. At high acceleration, there is a, another phenomenon which is well known, which is the Faraday instability. So it is, uh, so this uh, summarizes the different types of bouncing. The, the drop can bounce either at the forcing frequency for low, sorry, for low uh, acceleration, or at half the forcing frequency for large acceleration because it's, it sort of jumps high and falls after two periods. Okay, so uh, in fact, in the region, in the, in the domain where it, it uh, has this uh, period doubling of, of its bouncing, then it becomes a walker. Which one? This one? No, this, is uh, uh, this one. Yeah, sorry, the, the pointer doesn't work very well. So uh, <laughs> this is uh, the size of a drop vertically in the diameter of the drop. Yes. And horizontally is the acceleration of the, the amplitude of the acceleration of the bus. So it's in unit of G. So this is 1G and this is uh, 4.5G. So uh, actually above this threshold here, you trigger Faraday waves. So this is known since Faraday. If you oscillate a bus vertically, you generate surface waves, standing waves. And they appear over a certain threshold due to the damping by viscosity. Okay. So this is uh, what is shown in. Uh, so these are the waves. They are standing waves, and uh, in fact, they are due to parametric forcing of the surface waves, a little bit like uh, f parametric forcing of a pendulum when you oscillate uh, the point of, uh, of suspension, and uh, these um, waves. If the fluid were, was not viscous, you would have several modes of oscillation possible. But since the fluid is viscous, you have several tongues, if you wish, of possibility of frequencies of the wave. Uh, since the fluid is viscous, the most unstable mode is the mode which is at half the frequency of forcing. So, uh, so in fact, this is, there is a threshold, a finite threshold, which is here. And all our experiments 
are, ju are done just below this threshold. So we are very close to the instability, for the instability. I will, I will insist on that uh, later. So uh, the, the first question that comes to mind, mind you, we didn't, uh, we <laughs> it took us some time to, fi <laughs> to find it, but uh, is what is the nature of the way that is associated with this, uh, with this uh, propagating uh, structure? So uh, uh, the, uh, we did a very simple uh, experiment, I think the simplest I've ever done during my whole life, which is uh, we, we wanted to see what is the wave generated by one bounce of the drop. So you, you take the bus, you just drop, it's, so with a drop you can't do it because it, it bounces all the time. But you can take a small steel ball, you, f you let it fall in the bus and you look at what the waves are emitted, what waves are emitted. So this is the situation on the left in the, when the bus is not vibrating, in which case you have a propagating wave. It's just like when you throw a stone in a pond, you see the waves moving away to infinity, and there's nothing special about it. Now, if you do the same thing in a vibrating bus, below the Faraday instability threshold, this is what you see. You have the same disturbance that propagates away in a similar way, but it leaves behind a pattern of standing waves. And these are Faraday waves that are damped, that will be damped because we are below the threshold of Faraday instability, but they will be damped on a finite time. Okay, so this uh, is the uh, spatial temporal diagram show, showing the same thing. And you see this time going down here. This is the initial disturbance by, of the bus. You see the two propagating waves moving out, leaving behind a pattern of standing waves. So uh, standing waves, as you know, are superposition of waves going in, uh, in the two directions. So you, you can imagine well uh, how the standing waves are generated by the point of impact. But the other wave is a wave coming back, so it's a sort of uh, advanced wave, if you wish. And it doesn't come from infinity, but it comes from the outer envelope of, of the of the w propagating waves. So let me show you. So this is uh, again uh, the, the thing is just to show you that indeed now that you know, indeed the field, the wave field of the drop is a field of standing waves. So the drop propagates propelled by standing waves. This is actually very important for the, the whole thing. So in fact, it, you have a system where the drop is piloted by standing wave, it's driven by standing wave. And so this is a very sharp contrast with the classical pilot waves because usual uh, pr uh, pilot waves are usually uh, traveling waves, you know, like bats or dolphins, they send uh, chirps or, or, or <laughs> to, and then they, they listen to the echo and they, they, their brain process uh, piloting, and this is not the case. Here we have a, a standing wave. So in fact, it's reminiscent, strangely reminiscent of the early, earliest model of De Broglie. De Broglie, in 1926, had this idea that uh, uh, electrons were associated with, uh, with waves, and these waves were standing waves. And he actually, he's, he wrote, so he had this, uh, this uh, Compton frequency uh, proper to the, to, to the particle, and he had this idea that there were two waves, one propagating outward, and the other one propagating inward, and he wrote, well, but there is a, some philosophical issue about the converging the advanced wave coming from infinity to converge at the right point. So, uh, so anyway, that's just, uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, there are this, this uh, small experiment that I've shown you with a, with a steel, drop, steel ball has generated a other experiments. I'm not directly involved in those. They are done by Emmanuel Faure and his group. And it's interesting to, to see uh, another way of, of understanding this, this system. Uh, uh, surface waves have a specificity is that they, for, for one thing you, you see them propagate, and also they, they move quite slowly. So you can do things to them while they are propagating. 
And in particular, you can change the index of uh, propagation, the, 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 the speed of propagation, as they are moving. So uh, Emmanuel has done uh, two very nice experiments that I'm going to show you. It's just a little bit aside from uh, my main talk, but I think it's, it's a very nice experiment, so it's worth showing. Uh, so you, you here it has a small jet of air, which creates an impulse, creates a disturbance, and this the disturbance moves away. And during the propagation of the uh, of this uh, wave, it will drop the bus so that very very rapidly g goes to zero very, during a very short time. So during a very short time, the wave is no longer propagating because there is no return force. Okay, so I will show you what it, what this does. I'm sorry. Okay, so you move, waves move away. Then there's a kick, and as you see, the wave, a part of the wave, comes back to the origin. So from a, so the idea, is, it's quite simple to understand. Transitorily, the wave is no longer a wave, propagating wave. It is just a deformation of the surface. When the gravity is restored, the wave has forgotten, so to say, in which direction it was moving, and it uh, moves in uh, both directions. OK, so then there are some waves coming from the boundaries, but that's irrelevant. So uh, OK, so it, what he calls this, uh, you can uh, do a sort of analogy with a mirror. And in a, in a way, this is the equivalent of a time mirror. You're doing a, a very, sorry, I don't control this very well. I don't know. OK. Uh, in a standard mirror, this is a propagation as a function of space. And here is a propagation as a function of time. During a very short interval, you had no gravity. And therefore, the propagating wave has become a uh, sort of deformation and generated two counter propagating waves. Now, there is an interesting. Uh, situation which I show you just for fun. Uh, these waves are all linear, so they superpose easily. So th you can do this even with complex patterns. And uh, OK, so here you have jets that have generated uh, complex waves in the shape of an Eiffel Tower. He does this trick of putting g to 0. Well, uh, then the film stops for some reason. And then the wave part of the wave returns, and since the waves are linear, you rebuilt your initial pattern, uh, even though it uh, looked uh, complex at one point. OK, so if I return now to Faraday waves, uh, this was just a parenthesis. Now I return to Far Faraday waves. In the case of Faraday waves, you modulate, since you oscillate the bus, you modulate the gravity. So the modulation of the gravity you can also see w with the same uh, type of, of, uh, of model, if you wish, as the analogous of a Bragg mirror in space. A Bragg mirror normally is a modulation of the index of refraction by layers in space. And here you, you have a, a system by which you modulate gravity in time. So if you uh, uh, get uh, so you d don't have uh, uh, modulation, then you start the modulation, and you get this. Uh, so I will show you a film which demonstrates this. Which he has this apparatus where he, he has this uh, bath, which is shallow here and deep here. So deep means that it is susceptible of Faraday waves, while the shallow region uh, doesn't do, do nothing. So he has the sources on the left in the gray region. He emits a wave. Nothing is vibrating. Then he stops the emitter and starts the oscillation of, of the bus. OK? And I will show you what this gives. And as you see, so, this is, so he, he generates this wave with his uh, periodic emitter. This is the limit between the two. Then he stops. And then he has his oscillation on this side. And as you see, this generates 
a wave moving back, which you see very clearly, and that comes back to focus at the point of uh, initial uh, generation. OK, so this was, uh, so in fact, uh, it, uh, you can show that it's, uh, it is a form of temporal uh, phase conjugation mirror, uh, something that you can get in, in, in optics, but by much more complex uh, means. OK, so that, that is a little bit apart from what I wanted to, to say. But it means that when you have a walker, this the droplet moving forward, it is associated with, it is surrounded, so to say, by a, 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 this type of mirror that concentrate, that keeps a standing wave all around it. Okay, so now I return to my talk, so to say. Uh, uh, this is just to show you that if I have this uh, bouncing droplet, this is a phase diagram that I showed you before. In the yellow region, you have these uh, walkers, and they can be tuned in A, B, and C. So this is closer to Faraday instability threshold. The, w the drop in uh, all three cases is associated with a wave, a standing wave. In the first case, it looks like this. And then when you get very close to Faraday instability threshold, it looks like that. So you see that the, even though the, the drop moves approximately the same velocity in all three cases, in the third case, the uh, wave field is much more complex than in the first case. So this will be very important. This is what we will call low memory, and this is what we call the high memory uh, regimes. I will come uh, to that a little bit later. So, uh, uh, Emmanuel Faure and Mathieu Labousse and uh, uh, Maurice Rossi and Eric Sultan devised a, a uh, numerical model for the walkers, which is uh, rather crude and very efficient. So that's why I can say that it's crude, because it's, very <laughs> it's still very efficient. In that, it doesn't, uh, 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 it doesn't model in detail, for instance, the hydrodynamic of the collision of the drop. But the model is like uh, follow, you, 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 so you have a, a walker moving on the bus along a certain trajectory, and at each of its bounce, it generates a standing wave, which is a, a J0 Bessel function, centered at the point of collision. And the wall uh, field is a superposition of such of these, uh, of these Bessel functions with a time of decay, which depends on the distance to the Faraday instability threshold. So it can be either short or long, meaning that only few bounds will, uh, gen uh, will uh, define the, the field, or many of them. Now you have, you have to have a model for the bouncing itself. So the bouncing itself is also very simple. You just assume that it has a free flight, that open collision with the bus, the drop generates a disturbance of the bus, and then has friction, and therefore its velocity is uh, uh, decreased, and so the, and then it receives a kick because the bus is oscillating, and it will leave the bus in a, in a, a, with a velocity that is pro that has a term which is proportional to the gradient th w to the local slope of the of the bus. Okay. So this means that at time t i plus 1, it is, this is coefficient alpha, which is small compared to 1, plus this, this term, which says that the, 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 the drop is kicked by the surface. Now, of course, when you have done that, you add to the, to the, to the field a new, a new wave. You look at where the drop will fall again. You measure, you compute the local slope, and you kick it again. And when you do that, you recover all the main properties of the, uh, for instance, this is that on the left it is a measured uh, wave field of a walker, and on the right it is a, a computed one. As you can see, this, sorry, this looks uh, like a Fresnel interference pattern, because it is a Fresnel interference pattern. It is the interference pattern of sources that are aligned along the previous trajectory of the drop. Now the thing is, uh, everything is, so 
This explains what I showed you before. Uh, here you have a contribution of only uh, five sources, here 10, here 50 previous sources. So you see that everything is very nice so long as the drop moves straight. But what happens if the drop doesn't move straight and revisit region that it has already disturbed? So this is going to be my the main issue. Ah, yes, incidentally, this is just for fun. Uh, just to show you that uh, there is memory, uh, the, the wave survives to the drop. So in fact, on the, in this particular uh, uh, film, there is a small drop somewhere, there, a small bubble there. And the, drubber, the bubbles uh, are the enemies of the drops. Sorry. So you see here you have a typical walker. It moves uh, at constant velocity, and it will uh, ultimately collide with a small bubble there. And as you see, the wave field survives. Okay, it survives for some time, which is a typical time, memory time that I've described. So incidentally, it means that you are kind of a, another walker moving in that region would be disturbed by the phantom of uh, the ghost of the previous one. Okay. Okay, so now what happens if the, the, the uh, trajectory is not straight? So this is what we explored in all this series of experiments. What I will describe in detail is the orbiting in a 2D potential well under self-spinning uh, uh, states. Okay, so the idea uh, was uh, to exert a force on the drop so that it would be submitted to a central force. And to look at the possible orbits of this uh, system, this was a thesis of uh, Stéphane Perard and Mathieu Labouste. So this can be implemented quite easily by putting some uh, a drop of ferrofluid inside the oil drop. So in fact, it sounds difficult, but in fact, it's easy. And uh, so ferrofluid is a liquid that can be easily magnetized if it's submitted to a constant magnetic field. So you you put a, a global magnetic field everywhere, and so the drop becomes a small dipole. And then you put a small magnet over, over the bus, and this creates a gradient of magnetic field so that the drop is uh, submitted to a central force. This is not so difficult. This is the setup. And the point is that the height of the magnet is tunable. You can pull it up and down. So in fact, when we started the experiment, we had some si something in mind. See, because we were looking for quantization effects. And pseudo quantization, there is no Planck constant, of course. Uh, and we were, you know, the ideal would be to have uh, energy quantization. But in this system, you cannot have energy quantization because the velocity of the drop is constant. And the wave vector associated with the drop is also constant. So the energy of the drop is constant. So there is no way you can have several levels in a harmonic potential well. So this experiment is not feasible with walkers, unfortunately. So wha but what we, we realized that we could do something else, which is to look by changing the potential well, we could look if something happens for certain widths of the potential well. You change the potential well and you look if there is something special for certain widths of the potential wave. Okay. So that's what we did. And uh, this is just done by pull, pulling up and down the, the, the magnet. So I'll first show you what happens at low memory. So the walker is a walker. It moves. It has a localized wave field around it. And what you see is that, so you remember that it works at constant velocity. So since its velocity is constant, it means that the only orbit possible is circular. You can't have uh, ellipses. So you do see a circular orbit. And the radius of this orbit varies continuously with this, uh, this lambda parameter that you will see is the width uh, of the potential well, so the return force. And you see that it should be proportional. It should be along the, the red line. It is slightly shifted because it, uh, there is a correction due to the wave but it's a not a uh, very big correction, and it has been computed by John Bush in MIT. 
Okay, so now this is at low memory. Now I take the same walker and I just go nearer to Faraday instability threshold. And this is what the uh, trajectory looks like when you go to high memory. If you do nothing special, you get this, uh, this noodle uh, uh, spaghetti uh, looking uh, plate. This is, what, this is a film showing the uh, corresponding trajectory. So you can see that it has a lot of waves. Because since you have long memory, the, the walker creates waves all the time. And this wave drives it. And it is still submitted to a radial force. But with this result of having a disordered, uh, a disordered uh, pattern. OK. But if you tune very carefully the distance of the magnet to the surface, you find that for certain widths of the, of the, of the potential well, you recover stable circular orbits. And they are discrete, as you see here. And furthermore, so this is, uh, yeah, this is a diagram. These are the function of memory here. So this is a ray, possible radii as a function of memory. For low memory, all values are possible. For high memory, only discrete values of the orbit radius are possible. And this is the corresponding pattern. Now, on the, uh, what it came as a surprise is that other trajectories, other stable trajectories show up. Lemnitz skates, trefoils, and then one that was called the dog bone by one of my colleagues. And, um, and uh, they are also all observed for very uh, narrow range of values of the pa uh, parameter. So we want to characterize them. So if you remember, again, I have no energy in the system, but I have a size of the orbit which is in a way somewhat similar to the, to the energy. And then I can also measure a mean angular momentum. So this is what we did. You have this uh, radius, mean radius here and mean angular momentum here that we measure experimentally. And we plot them as a function of the width of the, of the... So these are only the stable trajectory. And as you see, both the radius and the angular momentum are quantized and take only discrete values. And the larger, so when you go to larger lambda, means a, a wider uh, uh, potential well. And as you see, you have more and more uh, possible solutions. So instead of pl plotting uh, R and RL as a function of lambda, you can plot R as a function of L, in which case you get this type of diagram where you find that all the stable solutions form a uh, sort of little packet. So the black region here are these uh, circular orbits. The red region here are the Lemnitz gates. The Lemnitz gates have a zero uh, uh, average angular momentum. The green things are the dot bones. The blue things are the trefoils. And these, uh, uh, so these are is in real size different uh, orbits. And this is a comparison to what you get with a numerical simulation, which is a very good agreement. Once again, all of these results are high memory uh, results. Okay, incidentally, if you go to Cointanogy and a book and you look at what are the, uh, 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 m <laughs> the uh, states in a 2D uh, potential well, you find that they obey some uh, relation between n and m, which is, uh, so of course, it is cheated. Because in our case, we don't have energy. But we can, in a way, we say that n is uh, equivalent of the size of the orbit in our case. But it is cheated. But I mean, all this analogy is linked with the fact that we have a characteristic wavelength, which is the, the, uh, which is the Faraday wavelength and which can be compared to the Breuil wavelengths. OK, so, uh, so uh, I mean, now, why is it quantized? Where, where does it come from? So the basic idea is that you have the drop moving in a certain region of space, creating waves all the time. And as it does that, it finally excites eigen modes of this region of space. 
So you can analyze this by using a, a um, decomposition, sorry, a decomposition, uh, any, any standing wave field you can uh, decompose by uh, uh, in, in on the basis of Bessel function chosen at any point that you choose, and in our case we will choose the center of the uh, of the um, of the uh, orbit, and uh, and so this uh, the amplitude of the of each of these modes depending on where does the drop orbit. So we limit myself for the time being to circular orbit. This is uh, using a uh, theorem called Graf theorem. Okay, so I will show you this from numerical simulation. Uh, on the top, you see the whole field of a, a droplet orbiting on the smallest possible orbit. And these are the first three Bessel functions of the mode centered at the center of the orbit. As you see, the J1 is very strong. It rotates, and that's the mode that drives the drop into motion. And J0, surprisingly, is very weak. And uh, it, I mean, surprisingly, it was surprising to us. Uh, so the, the, the idea is the following. The, the drop, it is like a drum. If you hit the drum at a node, you are very inefficient at generating waves. If you hit at an anti-node, then you're very efficient. The drop does the same. If the drop rotates, at the distance from the center, which coincides with the zero of the J0 Bessel function, it, is, it doesn't excite the J0 Bessel function. So this is a situation in R1 here, where you have no wave excited. Now, if the drop has a radius of orbit slightly larger than that, it will excite this J0 Bessel function, which will exert onto it a force that will bring it back to the node. And uh, same thing in if the orbit is too, uh, n too small, then it will be a reverse force going the other direction. All these meaning that there is a uh, potential, a sort of wave-induced potential generated by the drop, self-induced potential, and the drop sits at the minimum of this potential. So th with this idea, the radii of the orbit, circular orbit should coincide with the zeros of the central Bessel function, which they do, as you can see here. So the idea is that you, you create this uh, potential, the, the drop creates its own potential, and this potential is stronger and stronger when the memory grows, because you add more and more uh, waves. Okay. Uh, so this explains the radio. The same uh, reasoning can be applied to the Lemnitz case, a bit more complicated, but you can uh, recover. So it means that altogether, this means that you indeed, when you change the width of the, of the potential well, you indeed have something special that happens for certain widths of the potential well. Okay. So you, you attempted to say, well, these are eigenstates but you have not proved that these are eigenstates. <laughs> so the idea is, can it uh, be, can, uh, does it have any of the properties of an eigenstate? So now you, I will return, uh, so after I've spoken about only the, uh, the, the uh, uh, simple uh, situation, I return to the complex trajectories, and I look at this uh, spaghetti mess, and if I look carefully, then I realize that it's not such a mess, uh, sorry, uh, in the sense that at uh, a given time, uh, drop orbits quite <laughs> quietly on one circular orbit, then jumps to a Lemnitz case, then returns to a circular orbit, and so on. And this is a time recording of the angular momentum. And as you see, it has a sort of intermittency where you have, in this region, Lemnitz case, then orbit, then the case, and so on. And in fact, the transition is very fast between the two. So there is very little time spent in, in, uh, in between. So you can uh, build a PDF of the probability of being either a Lemnitz case or a, uh, so this I will escape. So what we did, okay, so this, I, I don't know if you remember, this is a 
diagram of the radius as a function of the width of the potential well. These are this is the eigen mode uh, on Leibniz case. This is the uh, eigen mode of uh, larger orbits, circular orbits. And in between, in all this gray region here, the uh, orbit is disordered. Okay. So we explore this, which is very tedious, by uh, going step by step in all the points in between and looking at the, at the signal. And what you see is that you always have an intermittency phenomenon. So that's you know, a nonlinear phenomenon by which you jump from one solution to the other. Uh, the probability of being in a limb case being initially very large, and then the probability of being in a circular orbit increasing slowly. And so you can uh, look at the probability of being in it of this state by uh, looking at uh, how much time you spend in each of these states. And you find the probability of being in a limited state decreases, and the probability of being in a circular state increases. And the sum of this probability is approximately 1. And why approximately 1? Because, of course, there is a transition during which it, you are not in a clear state. But you see that it's, it's uh, quite a, uh, a surprise, because you have, it means that the, uh, the the, the state, the stable state that we have defined, are the base of a decomposition of irregular, of the uh, situation of irregular motion. At any given time, uh, you, the, 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 the drop is in one of these orbits. Okay. But the uh, relative probability depends on where you are, what tuning you have found. And if you had did a, if you did a blind measurement, in this system, fast measurement, f fast and blind, you would find that you are in a state, in one of these states. But if you repeated the experiment, you would find different, uh, different states. So in fact, it has some of the properties of a wave function collapse. I mean, such a blind measurement would have. Okay, okay so that was the, how much time do I have? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so this is uh, a chaos. How much time? Fifteen minutes, including questions. Fifteen. Five can be mixed. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, so, uh, okay. So we we looked a little bit more into detail just to so uh, to to characterize this chaos. What is surprising is that you. So here we looked at the, the two these two levels, and what you find. So we looked systematically, and as you see, if you are well tuned, you are on a circular orbit, and then you detune the circular orbit, it destabilizes. When it destabilizes too much, you, you undergo jumps that lead you to the Leibniz gate state. You can do uh, Poincaré map techniques, which are classical in nonlinear physics, and you find that uh, these are not really Poincaré, they are first return maps chosen on the maximum of the radii. And you find that you have this, this uh, uh, return map, very, uh, very typical of a nonlinear phenomenon, uh, with, with uh, attractors that are the main, the main uh, states. OK, so this is just for, so in uh, well, this I will skip. Just, uh, this just shows that uh, you have a, a Lyapunov exponents, if you look at the divergence of the orbits uh, in the regions where it's chaotic, the Lyapunov exponent is uh, uh, largest in between the stable region, which uh, is pretty obvious, but it's better when it's shown. Okay, so uh, in five minutes, I will show you the possibility of having self-spinning states. So I told you that we, the drop, as it moves, builds up a wave potential, which is created by its motion. And this wave potential is uh, uh, large if, uh, if, the, um, if the memory is large. So if, you are, if the drop is, is submitted to a, a central force, it will stand in the, in the here, and it uh, will not use this potential. But what happens if you have no force? So the idea was the following. 
you here in this previous experiment, I don't know if you remember, but we had a small magnet. Here we don't have a small magnet. We replace it by an iron bar so that all the magnetic field in the system is generated by the current in the coils. So you can switch off the current. Magnetic field goes to zero, and the force exerted on the drop goes to zero. So the question is what, uh, what will be its trajectory? So I can show you the film. So this, uh, oh yeah, I must tell you, you see that there is this uh, black triangle on top, and in the middle of the black triangle, there is a white dot. This white dot uh, tells you if the magnetic field is on or off. So we are at very high memory. The drop rotates on its small orbit. And at one point, we'll sw switch off. Uh, the so you see, this is a small orbit. You can see that the field is the same that I showed you before. And here the, the force is on. Okay. And then it's off. And as you see, the drop keeps orbiting, even though it's submitted to no force whatsoever. Okay, then finally it, uh, it escapes. But the time during which it remains stable is long compared to the memory time. It's more than memory time. Okay. So this is what you have seen. So, in fact, the, the radius is a little bit l larger when you are self-orbit because there is no more force to, to maintain the, the drop. So the drop has to build its own field to, to, to be maintained. And that's what you see. And if you do the numerical simulation, you recover the same. And you can study the stability. In fact, the stability is a matter of noise. If you reduce the noise, this solution becomes stable. Okay. So this means that Depending on the uh, way you have prepared the system, you can have this orbit or a linear trajectory. They only differ from each other by the, by the initial preparation of the system. Okay. Uh, yeah, this I will skip. But you can ask me questions if you wish. Okay. So there is a form of, of duality in our system. Uh, we have, a, a, in, a, in a way, this is not far from the ideas of De Bruyne. De Bruyne had the idea that a particle uh, could be driven by a real uh, wave. So in fact, there is a, a little bit of confusion because the, the pilot wave models are always uh, nowadays called De Bruyne-Bohm models. In fact, it's misleading because uh, De Bruyne and Bohm are actually quite different in the sense that uh, De Bruyne thought of a physical wave, was Bohm as a, a, a wave, uh, as, a, as a Schrodinger equation, and therefore look at trajectories of probabilities, not, not the trajectory of a single particle. And De Bruyne noted that, I don't, know, I don't have the re reference here, but when Bohm published his article, De Bruyne uh, said it's all very interesting, but it's not my idea, it's a different idea. Okay, so in fact, uh, the difference with the Broglie system is that here we have a memory, which was not considered in the, in the system. And in fact, the Broglie never did any, any calculation or, or uh, there was no computers, there was no theory of chaos, there was no, so I mean, uh, uh, the, this uh, idea was not uh, very fruitful in a way. So in fact, uh, our system has uh, something that is very specific, that is, it is uh, spread out, it is spread out. You can consider it in two ways. You can consider it from a wave point of view, in which case you are, it is spread out in space, because you have to consider the whole wave field if you want to understand the, the next m move of the, of the drop. Or if you take the particle point of view, you can ignore the wave, but then it is spread out in time because you have to take into account all the previous collision of the drop with the, with the surface to understand the next trajectory. So it is a, sp a spread out system, not to say non-local. Okay, so in fact, uh, this is a sort of uh, interesting way of looking at the system, which is a, <laughs> this is a good way to get published. You say it's like a Turing machine. Uh, uh, in fact, it is like a Turing machine in the sense that 
you can see it as a, 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 a system having an interplay between the drop on the on the on the wave uh, on the surface. The drop at each bounce writes an information under the shape of a Bessel function in the surface, then fries off, and then comes back and reads this information to determine its next move. So this is a, and the, the information is sustained because you have the forcing, Faraday forcing that maintains the wave. So the nearer to Faraday, the better. The, and finally, uh, the memory can be erased. This is the part that I didn't show you uh, of uh, time reversal. Uh, so in fact, um, in a way, it's not surprising. I mean, this, this system is, uh, in, in, when, when you think of biological system or social system, uh, they're always defined with the memory. It's our physical system, which are a bit strange, that you, you don't need a, a memory. Uh, so in that particular case of uh, workers, the uh, memory is stored in a wave, which gives it uh, specific uh, properties. Now, if you think of uh, self-organization, which is a term which is in fashion nowadays, Usually people look at self-organization self of a large number of entities, like birds or things uh, interacting. And in fact, th in this system, you have a self-organization of the particle with its own past. So it's a, a one particle self-organization, so to say. And uh, finally, uh, strangely, some, uh, some wave-like, uh, wave-mediated, uh, this wave-mediated past memory, uh, uh, generates some uh, quantum-like behaviors. And so I think it's still uh, 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 this uh, large play field for theoretician in the, with this system. Thank you. We have some time for questions. <coughs> All right, so uh, why is it safe to assume that you can describe the fluid with a linear equation? And what would happen if, the, if you had a nonlinear system? And like even more interestingly, if you had a nonlinear system which had solitons, for example, if you had something that would model a KDV equation or something no, like I, that. I didn't say the system was linear. The system is not linear because the bouncing is not linear. The, f the waves are linear. Okay. The waves are small amplitude, so you can assume that they are, they are linear. But the system is not linear because what the uh, I don't think it would change much. Uh, well, I mean, of course, it would saturate. It would make things um, even more complicated. It is. It is a problem. Uh, okay, it is a problem from an experimental point of view, because uh, when you go to very high memory, the waves accumulate, and accumulating, they finally become large amplitude, and they trigger uh, real Faraday instability. So, in in the very high memory regime. This situation becomes complex. In fact, uh, 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 sh what I showed you, the results that I've showed you, are in a, with a memory uh, s less less than 500. If you go to a thousand or two thousand, then uh, tra linear trajectory uh, is no longer stable, apparently, and you get uh, you get uh, a sort of a diffusive motion with some straight motion, and then these little uh, self-orbitings that I've shown you. So the, the, the drop traps itself into these small orbits and then move again. And so you get some kind of diffusive uh, motion. We didn't study much of this regime because experimentally it's, uh, it's uh, not well, uh, it's very difficult to have re reproducible results. So, yeah. So do, do you know some kind of fairly precise equations of motion for this droplet and are they Hamiltonian? No. Ah, they are not, okay, they are not uh, Hamiltonian in the sense you have friction, so you have, you have some no, no, but there is of course Hamiltonian but friction, so. Yeah, but uh, in fact, uh, no, there is no, there is a numerical model that works very well. But there is no theoretical, uh, global theoretical model of this system. That's why I was uh, appealing to a uh, theoretician. Uh, th so the system is sustained because the forcing brings in energy. So in fact, this energy 
is uh, so it's interesting that this energy is fed both to the wave field and to the droplet because the, 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 the oscillation kicks the droplet up. Then when the drop falls back, it, restitute, uh, it gives back some of its energy to the, create a new wave. That will be sustained by the, by the forcing. So the, 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 the oscillation uh, sort of uh, p uh, gives energy to both the droplet um, and, the, um, and the wave field. Unfortunately, this leads to a stable, to a steady solution. But uh, whether it is, uh, it, it, it is not um, uh, Hamiltonian in the sense that the velocity is constant. So this, see, it is, it is forced. If you want to account for his, it, uh, for the motion, you have to take into, a, uh, to, to say that there is a sort of friction that will limit the velocity and that will push if the droplet goes too slowly, it will be pushed back to its uh, uh, equilibrium velocity, and if it, so you have you have some kind of friction which is negative, below uh, which is uh, negative below the, the velocity and positive above. So it's not Hamiltonian, not really, uh, but it uh, leads to steady regime. It has a. Simpler question. So at the beginning, you show the re show the reflection of a walker on the boundary, in fact, of your confining area. Yeah. Um, so it means that if you have, say, a small area confining, uh, say, a small confining area, uh, you have an interaction uh, with the eigenmodes of the of this area. I, w I thought that you would show uh, uh, you discuss this interaction. Uh, maybe. You Maybe you are, you investigated that and you did not talk about. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. could so oh. could you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have the transparency. We did that with with uh, John Bush from MIT, and uh, we confined the walk. So, okay. Uh, my, my answer is in two parts. The first part is okay. We confined the droplet in a circular uh, coral, and we l looked at the probability of, be of a droplet being in various points of this coral in the, regi in the regime of very high memory when the trajectory is very, very uh, chaotic. And we find that indeed, probability of the droplet being in different regions of the coral has a wave-like aspect. So you have a sort of mean, uh, mean, uh, mean probability that this uh, wave-like. Now, uh, on the other hand, the interaction with the walls is a, a difficult issue because, uh, as you have, may have noticed, uh, the, um, the um, collision with the wall doesn't lead to uh, uh, reflection with the normal laws of reflection. Usually, the drop impinges on the wall and then is reflected at a uh, more or less fixed angle. So, the, uh, this, uh, so this we found, we studied. And never, pu and never published because we couldn't understand it. Uh, so, uh, so I mean, people in MIT have published it, but uh, I'm not sure <laughs> it's so clear for them either. Uh, so it's it is linked with I think the the hydrodynamic of the it's you know it's hydrodynamic wave. So there is in fact w you, you can have boundaries which have a, a meniscus, so this is no good. Or you can have submarine uh, boundaries, but then you have some friction, extra friction on the submarine boundary, so it might be linked with that. So it's uh, the interaction. That's why I showed you the the potential well experiment because it's it's very safe. It's far from boundary. The, the orbits are confined, and it's a, it's a very well uh, neat experiment. If you wish. No. If you have time, uh, I would be very curious to see the slide uh, which explains the 0.26 uh, epsilon equal to 0 0.6, uh, 26, the, the transparency at 26. Ah, yes, sorry, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, I skipped it. It's true. It's just a correction of of. Uh, okay. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So in fact, that's that's the empirical law uh, that we found by King, and in fact, this uh, value coincides with the first zeros of the J zero Bessel function center. Uh, this is empiric. This epsilon is empiric. It's, it's what we had found before uh, knowing about these uh, J zero zeros. But you have no explanation of the numbers. Well, if if you look at the zeros of the J zero Bessel function, it, it fits well with this number. No, no, but uh, this is just empirical. In fact, uh, the, the, the truth is that uh, these, uh, these uh, radii are here. And if you look at the values, successive values of these radii, it's going. You're sure this is yeah, okay. The, 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 the you can predict the well, we can predict from the zero of Bessel function. No, no, we can predict. Uh, can Th there are the zeros <laughs> of the centered Bessel function centered at the center of the orbit. No, no, this is uh, predicted. Okay. Yeah. But uh, when we did the experiment first, we, uh, we did empirical measurement, hence uh, 0 